Welcome to this episode of Intellectual Conservatism. Today, I'm here with Dr. Christopher Tomaszewski. Uh, we're going to be talking about his doctoral dissertation. And, you know, Christopher, I think what I'll do is I'll just have you kind of talk first about um, what you've been up to. So, I mean, I, I know I've asked you this question before, but I mean, you're now a professor, right? And you're teaching and doing a lot of great work. And so can you just uh, briefly update us on what you've been up to? Sure, yeah, so I'm coming to the end of my first year here at Belmont Abbey College, um, which has been a great academic home for me uh, so far. Um, I'm really enjoying uh, teaching here, uh, working here. Um, it's one of the Newman List schools, uh, so it's a great place for a traditional Catholic philosopher to uh, be teaching and working. Um, my students have been amazing. Uh, my colleagues are uh, equally amazing. Um, so yeah, it's been a perfect fit for me. Um, I've been uh, teaching a lot of courses that as a, uh, as a graduate student, I didn't get to teach um, upper level courses on philosophy of mind. I'm teaching philosophy of God this semester. In fact, just this, uh, just today, I, I taught my philosophy of God students, which includes among them the uh, uh, some of the seminarians for for the diocese of Charlotte, why uh, uh, why modal collapse fails? Actually, mm -hmm. we were talking about question nineteen from the Prima Pars on the will of God, and we got into a little bit into modal collapse and why that doesn't work. <laughs> um, um, planning to maybe teach some applied ethics uh, next semester. So I've I've, been, I've just been having a ball teaching. Um, a lot of courses that I've, I've never taught before, but I've wanted to teach. Um, uh, on the research side of things, it's been a little slower going, mostly because, yeah, I have been uh, doing uh, a lot of work to catch up with um, all the new teaching. Uh, and uh, my wife and I are also just trying to continue settling on, uh, settling in here in North Carolina. We just... Uh, we just got a puppy, um, you know, so my hands are, are full on the home <laughs> side of things. Um, but I actually uh, just sent in my chapter for the upcoming uh, Robert Coons and Jonathan Fuqua volume on um, classical theism. Uh, so that, that's my follow up, uh, finally, <laughs> on modal collapse, um, although I suspect I'll have more to say about that. Um, I also have uh, a paper on uh, Aquinas on racism that's in the works that I that I actually presented at the American Catholic Philosophical Association last November, uh, and that people seem to like um, an important timely topic, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, I still have to carve up my dissertation and, and make either a series of papers or a book proposal out of it. I'm not entirely sure what I want to do with that just yet. Um, so that's the, yeah, that's the research side of things. It's been great. Well, Christopher, all that sounds very exciting, but today we're here to talk about that very dissertation. And so um, could you just describe uh, what is the title, right? Just let, let's go to the basics. And then I think that'll help us piece together um, everything that we'll want to talk about from there. Right. Um, uh, so I called it mortal persons and their immortal souls. Um, and um, the, well, the lion's share of, of the dissertation is dedicated to uh, defending a thesis that um, many Thomists uh, do not like very much, uh, whereas there's broad spread, uh, sorry, uh, uh, broad support among Christians for the thesis that human souls are immortal. Uh, there is um, far less support for the thesis that uh, that we, the human persons themselves, are not, um, uh, at least not by nature, uh, immortal. Um, and so, uh, yeah, the lion's share of the dissertation is 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 targeted at, at trying to convince people of two things. One, that uh, Thomas Aquinas taught. Uh, that human persons do not exist um, in the interim state between death and the general resurrection. Their souls do. He famously defends that. 
uh, in a number of places. Um, and that those, th those defenses are themselves controver controversial, but my, my aim in this, uh, in this project was not to uh, defend those. That's been done by many people um, uh, many times over the years. Uh, but rather to defend the the much more um, the much more controversial and much more hated, at least among many Thomists, uh, a conclusion that that the human person that the human person does not does not survive in that um, interim state. Uh, and there's a lot of I think confusions, um, misconceptions about that thesis, about that view. And uh, so, you know, I argue for it. I argue that it's Aquinas's view. I argue that it's the truth. And I try to um, say what the thesis does not entail um, and what it does not mean. Um, yeah. So when we talk about between the de uh, our deaths and the general resurrection, um, obviously, like the, the interim state, as, we, as you put it, right? So um, are we talking about like the souls that are in heavenly beatitude? Um, so the saints and even those who are um, damned, are we talking about that uh, particular yeah. group of, pe of persons? Okay. And we'd or, also be yeah. talking about, we'd also be talking about souls that are currently in mm -hmm. purgatory. Um, the, uh, the view actually has a very interesting connection with purgatory that, that I'll, I'll mention a little later, but it is, I, I, I construe it in terms of the interim state because I, I do very much want to distinguish my view from mm -hmm. the view of um, the you know atheist materialist, for example, who does not believe in any afterlife whatsoever uh, for the human person, um, right? So my view um, is one on which uh, obviously I exist now, you exist now, we all exist now, right? Um, but that at death, we cease to exist in that period from death to the general res resurrection, our souls uh, go on existing mm -hmm. um, and are uh, rewarded or punished in accordance with their merits. Um, and then at the general resurrection, I begin to exist again mm. um, and, and go on to uh, heavenly beatitude or um, eternal uh, damnation as my merits deserve. Um, so very important, I guess, right from the outset, especially for anybody who has never heard of this view at all before, uh, to understand that um, we're really just talking about the finite period of time between death and resurrection. I'm not in any way, shape, or form arguing for the thesis that human persons die and cease to exist and never exist again. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm just arguing for the thesis that it do, do not exist in the finite period of time that, that, that is generally called among, among Catholic philosophers and theologians, the interim state uh, between death and, and, re and the resurrection. So just as a piece of terminology, uh, I mean, and this is, a, this is a debate that's been going on for a while. Um, so there's names for people who hold views on either side of this question. Um, the corruptionists are uh, include me and the other <laughs> who, who hold to a view on which the human persons do not exist in the interim state. And survivalists um, hold to a view on which the human person does exist in the interim state constituted by his or her soul alone. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the debate basically boils down to whether on Aquinas's view, there can be such a thing as a human person constituted by his or her soul alone, or whether, as I think Aquinas does clearly teach, the body is an essential part of the human person. Yeah. You know, I was chuckling because I'm just like thinking, you know, who wants to be called a corruptionist, right? Um, <laughs> but of course, like, you know, there you know, it's, it's trying to convey an idea. It's not trying to be a loaded term. Right. But right. Um, yeah, that's actually a, a great place to kind of seg into because the mm -hmm. it, reason it's called corruptionism is because uh, I think the corruptionism, as I understand it, follows very immediately from the way that Aquinas thinks. Well, the way that Aquinas thinks about three things, his natural philosophy, just how does 
change and especially substantial change work in general for Aquinas, right? His uh, more general metaphysics um, and his philosophical anthropology, what is man, right? Um, and one, uh, the reason why my view is gets labeled corruptionism in the literature um, is in large part due to the fact that so the most basic arguments for corruptionism rely on uh, a, what Aquinas thinks a human person is together with how he thinks substantial change works, right? And, which involves, substantial change always involves uh, um, the, uh, well, it frequently involves the generation uh, of a new substance simultaneous with the corruption, as he, as he calls it, um, the corruption of the old substance, right? So just take a very uncontroversial case uh, where Thomas Sowell agree, right? You have a, a, a tree in a forest, it dies, right? Um, death, the death of living things for Aquinas, as well as for most of the other scholastics, um, was characterized in these terms of substantial change, right? Death is a kind of substantial change where the substance that was living dies and thereby ceases to exist and becomes something else, right? Um, uh, dead wood in the case of a tree. Um, unless it, you know, uh, it depends on what causes the substantial change. If the tree died because it burned down, then it's substantially corrupted into ash rather than dead wood, I suppose. Or um, like uh, my human body right now, it's like living, it's an or it's a unified organism, right? And right. when I die, it'll just be human remains. It won't be a Correct. human body. It's going to be just yeah. a corpse. So the, the, the fact that, you know, and, and this is a view that Aquinas inherits directly from Aristotle, Right. The, the fact that there is a substantial change in human death is what underwrites uh, Aquinas's doctrine, uh, you know, that right, uh, uh, the, the eye of a dead man is called an eye only equivocally. Right. The hand of a dead man is called a hand only equivocally. And even the very um, body of a dead man is called a body only equivocally. Right. Strictly speaking, on Aquinas's view, the thing you see in a, in, in a coffin at a wake, right, is not a body, right? We would rather call it a, a corpse. It's the remains of a human body. Uh, it is what was generated by the substantial change which took place at the death of the person whose remains those are. Um, and so because uh, a lot of these simple arguments for corruptionism are tied up with the, with Aquinas's doctrine of substantial change and the role that corruption plays in it, uh, my view has come to be labeled corruptionism, which I, I'm perfectly, perfectly fine with. Um, but uh, yeah, that gets us, I guess, right into what the basic argument is. And, it, and I guess it's worth laying, laying that out. For uh, your uh, viewers who are interested, um, the most vocal proponent of corruptionism in the literature has been Patrick Toner, who wrote a lot of the seminal papers um, on this topic. Um, so I recommend his work uh, uh, to anybody who wants to do a deep dive on this or even maybe get into the literature themselves. Um, but the idea here, right, is uh, that the death of a human person is a kind of substantial change. Um, like any other instance of substantial change. And uh, because it's like any other instance of substantial change, um, it involves the corruption of, this, of one substance and the generation of some new one. Um, the only plausible candidate for the substance that's being corrupted um, in the substantial change that is the death of a human person is that human person. And so, um, and Aquinas also believes that if a substance is corrupted, that is the, that is, the cessation of that substance's existence. Um, and so when human persons die, by being corrupted, they cease to exist. Um, now, there is one very important thing that Aquinas thinks is different about the death of a human person from the corruption of any other kind of corporeal substance, namely that the form of a human person is not corrupted when he or she dies. And that's, that's quite right, that's perfectly true. Um, 
But that I think tells us really nothing about that. That that that's no reason to think. I I say um, that the corruption of a human that the corruption of a human uh, person is um, exempt from the rules that Aquinas lays down. The logical rules that Aquinas lays down concerning what happens to substances when they're corrupted uh, in general. Uh, namely that they cease to exist. It, it, um, the human person case is different in, in the sense that uh, the form continues to exist. And the continued existence of that form is the uh, foundation of the possibility that that person might exist again, right? Obviously at the, at the resurrection, but on my view does not constitute the ongoing existence of that person before the resurrection, right? There's special divine action that uh, is necessary to bring that person into existence, um, namely the resurrection of the body. And when you talk about form, I mean, obviously, you know, if my audience has been watching my show faithfully, they'll know like, okay, he's not talking about form as something like shape or outline, right? right? So could you just briefly explain what you mean by form uh, for anybody who might not be familiar? Right. So uh, just in general, uh, form is a, a principle of intelligibility for substances, right? It makes, it gives them the nature that they have. Um, so on um, both Aristotle and Aquinas's view, right, form is a principle of intelligibility. It makes a thing to be what it is. It's the ground of uh, our ability to know what anything is, right, is, is, is by knowing its form. Um, Matter, on the other hand, is, is the principle of individuation for substances. It makes it, uh, uh, so form makes a substance to be of this kind and matter makes a substance to be this individual of that kind, right? Um, in the case of living things, uh, forms get a special name. We call them souls. Uh, this is important to distinguish from the way in which uh, modern philosophers tend to use, modern and contemporary philosophers tend to use the word soul in which maybe human beings are the only things that have souls or rational animals are the only things that have souls. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, Aristotle and Aquinas use the term much more broadly than that, right? So, soul, suke, is merely a principle of life. And so anything that lives, even the most primitive uh, bacterium, um, as long as it lives, uh, it has it has a soul. Where soul here, right, is just nothing more than a special term um, for the form, a special kind of form, the kind of form that confers life on the body of which it's the form. All right. So obviously, when we die, right, we we lose the human form, or you know, the human form is lost, right. Um, so then, your argument is that okay, the soul obviously lives on at least the human soul, right? Um, I don't know if you talk about animals at all, right? But at least the human soul lives on. Um, now, you're saying that this human soul that endures and is immortal, right? Um, that is going to be in this interim state, whatever, wherever it is, hell, heaven, or purgatory. Um, yeah. This soul that is apart from a body is not a human person. Correct. Yeah. Right. And actually that claim by itself, at least, is a claim that all the survivalists will agree with me on. So really, OK. And the reason for that, the reason why that's the case is because Aquinas actually has a has a, a, a killer proof text in his commentary on First Corinthians, where he explicitly says that my soul is not me. Right. Or my soul is not I. Um, um, and so following as far as i can tell the, the primary person who's being followed in saying this is eleanor stump um following eleanor stump what the survivalists say instead is not that the not that my soul is me in the interim state um because then their view could not possibly be the Thomistic view um but rather that uh i go on i survive right at my death in the interim state constituted by my soul, right? So constitution is a special relationship uh, that's gotten a lot of attention over the past couple decades in metaphysics um, between uh, um, 
between two distinct things, right? So the claim mm -hmm. isn't that they're identical, but that one constitutes the other. A common example, right, is that is that the marble that constitutes the statue de David, right? The marble is allegedly distinct from the statue, um, but the marble constitutes the statue. Mm -hmm. um, there's this relationship of constitution between the marble and the statue. Or to give another example, right, you can think of, uh, you take a dollar bill out of your pocket, right? It's a slip of paper, but that slip of paper uh, constitutes, because of the social practices that surround it, mm. uh, a unit of U.S. currency. Um, and the thought is that the the dollar bill is not identical with the currency because I can kind of tear, I, I can like theoretically at least deposit that dollar bill with the bank. They can turn it into a, a digital uh, record of uh, having a dollar and tear the piece of paper up, right? In such a way that the dollar in some sense goes on, but the piece of paper doesn't. <laughs> um, that that's also controversial. Everything about constitution is controversial. Um, but the point here is just that the claim that survivalists make is not that in an interim state, my soul is me, but that in the interim state, there's two things, my soul and me, and that the relationship between them is one of constitution. Could you repeat that last part real quick? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Uh, the claim that survivalists make is not that in the interim state, my soul is me, uh, but that in the interim state, there are two things, my soul and me, and the relationship between them is one of constitution. Okay. Okay. So just to kind of reiterate what you said and make sure that I'm grasping it, right? So the survivalist is saying that like, you know, when I die, right, obviously form is lost um, and my soul is persisting onwards, right? Now the soul is not a human person. They will agree with that. Yep. But what they will say is that I still exist, right? But I'm constituted of my soul. Yeah, okay. one way one way to kind of think about it, and this is a, a way of thinking about it that's actually, that was, I learned about from Edward Fazer, but that mm -hmm. I turned into an argument against survivalism in my dissertation, um, is it, that the survivalist thinks of death almost like a whole body amputation, right? The, I'm a human person. Human person has a soul and a body. Um, I can obviously lose parts of my body um, and still survive, right? We see that all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and the survivalist just wants to go a step further, so to speak, right? It, it, he or she would like to say that um, I can, in fact, lose my whole body mm -hmm. um, and just be reduced down to uh, having my soul as my only remaining part um and survive that process right yeah. and, and, and that's what's going on in death right mm. I, I, i'm losing my whole body um but that that's okay uh so to speak um because i don't need any part of my body even my whole body mm -hmm. to survive i just need my soul right and then what's your claim exactly in the it's a counter right my claim uh is that um uh, again, both as a matter of interpreting Aquinas correctly, as well as a matter of like what the, what the truth is, is that that's just uh, not uh, how a death works. It's not what human beings are. And it's not how Aquinas thinks that substantial change works. Um, and it, not only is it not how Aquinas thinks that substantial change works, it's not how substantial change works. Um, so it might be worth actually getting into some of the some some of my some of my arguments um, mm -hmm. uh, for this. So um, here's what I label in my dissertation the most direct interpretive argument for corruptionism. So this is just targeted at trying to get people to think that this is what Aquinas thought, um, or at least even if you didn't don't think that this is what Aquinas thought, it's what Aquinas is committed to by his more fundamental beliefs in the philosophy of nature, metaphysics, and philosophical anthropology, right? Um, and it's pretty straightforward, just has two premises here. So, and these are both quotations. The premises are both quotations directly from um, Aquinas. Uh, the first one is, quote, in man, the person, hypostasis, and suppositum is a composite of soul and body, end quote. And that's from his, that's from the compendium, the compendium theologiae, chapter 211. 
Um, so there he's identifying uh, three things with, with each other, right? He's saying the person, the hypostasis, the suppositum. Suppositum is this really fancy Latin word that was a big deal in uh, scholastic philosophy. Uh, basically read it as substance for the time being. It's not exactly what it means, but it's uh, close enough for our purposes at the moment. Um, and saying those things are those things are all the same thing. And they're all the same thing as a fourth thing, namely the composite of soul and body, right? Um, so what am I? I'm the composite. I'm not, I'm not a soul, I'm not a body, I'm the composite, okay? Premise two, quote, the thing that is properly corrupted is neither, in, he's talking about this is in a context of death, right? So uh, he, he doesn't use the words in death, but it's the context of the quotation makes it clear he's talking about that. Quote, the thing that is properly corrupted in death is neither the form nor the matter nor the act of existing itself, but the composite, end quote. The composite of what? The composite of soul and body. Uh, that's from his disputed questions on the soul. Um, question one, uh, response to the 14th objection. So what follows, right? What am I? I'm the composite of body and soul. What is corrupted in death? It's the composite of body and soul. Um, so therefore, what follows is it is the man, the person, the hypostasis, and the suppositum, which for him are all the same thing, that is corrupted in the death of man. I am corrupted. I cease to exist. Um, that's an argument where I'm drawing on, as I said, his more fundamental commitments in philosophy of nature, metaphysics, and philosophical anthropology. But he also just has places where he outright affirms corruptionism, at least on my reading, and I think it's pretty plain, uh, such as in his, the Summa Contra Gentiles, book four, um, chapter 80, uh, paragraph one, where he says, quote, since then man is corrupted by death, and the very body of man resolved even into the primary elements, it does not seem possible for a man with identity in number to be restored to life, end quote. That's where he's considering objections to bodily resurrection before he defends the view, right? Um, but he's conceding that man is corrupted by death, right? That man ceases to exist and that this poses a problem for those who believe in a resurrection of the body, because it, it, it's, you got to say, well, how is it possible um, for a man with identity in number, uh, with numerical identity to be restored to life? Um, one reason I think that particular affirmation, I think there's a number of places where he explicitly affirms corruptionism, but one reason why I think that affirmation is particularly important is because Aquinas, like many uh, theologians before and after him, was very um, concerned with the question of how the resurrection is possible and how in the resurrection it's possible that the same thing, the numerically same thing is resurrected as what died. Um, and my claim is that, that that difficulty um, that Aquinas thinks he's confronting just doesn't exist on survivalism, right? Um, that if he really was a survivalist, let's put it this way, if he really was a survivalist, then all this, uh, all this spilled ink over the resurrection and how it's metaphysically possible, um, and it, how is it that God can bring back to life with numerical identity, the same thing that died is all for naught, right? Because he should have just said, um, it, he doesn't, he doesn't bring back with numerical identity what had died because what had died never ceased to exist. Um, so there just is no problem right, on survivalism, but Aquinas thought that there was a problem and spilled a lot of ink trying to solve it. Um, and so one thing that I think corruptionism gets right about Thomas's literature is that he wasn't tilting at windmills, so to speak, when he was a, trying to solve the problems of the, of the resurrection um, on corruptionism. But if survivalism is true, then I think he was tilting at windmills. In, in trying to solve all these alleged difficulties with the resurrection, because those difficulties just don't exist if survivalism 
is right. He ought to have just wrote down one sentence in response to all these questions that philosophers and theologians had been worried about going back, you know, to before Augustine, which is man never stops existing in death, right? Therefore, there is no problem of him coming back because he didn't stop existing in the first place, right? Um, that's all you have to say if survivalism is true, but it's not what he says. And it, not only is it not what he says, it's not what Augustine says, it's not what any of the fathers say, as far as I'm aware. Everybody uh, before and after uh, Aquinas, who is talking about the resurrection, never says that the solution to the alleged difficulties surrounding the resurrection, the metaphysical difficulties of numerical identity and so forth, that the solution to them is that there is no problem in the first place because man never stops existing. Um, that's just not what anybody says. And so the survivalists, at least in one of the many problems I think the survivalist faces is explaining why not just Aquinas, but Augustine and so many other huge, important philosophers, theologians, fathers of the church, um, all thought there was a problem where there really is none. Yeah, I think that explanation was really helpful because it, you know, I think I got latched on to human person, but I kind of forgot the main part of the thesis, which is what you're saying is, look, when I die, Swan is dead, right? Swan right. is gone. Okay. Um, Swan's soul lives on, but there's not like Swan in the interim state being uh, with him being constituted of his soul, right? It's right. just Swan's soul continues, and right? Okay. Yeah, and I and let me just say something else by way of explaining what the thesis is, because I've sometimes gotten strange looks from people where they just say, well, if you admit that the soul goes on and you didn't, but you deny that the human person does, like, I don't understand, people have told me that they don't understand um, what the difference is supposed to amount right. to. Mm -hmm. So here's one, if anybody who's listening uh, feels that same way, here's one uh, phenomenological way to think about what the difference is between corruptionists and survivalists. Um, that I think makes clear what the, what's at stake between us, I guess, which is on my view, on the corruptionist view, I think when I die, uh, hopefully warm in my bed, surrounded by my great grandchildren, um, the last experience I'm going, uh, the last experience I'm going to have that I am going to have is of being in my bed, surrounded by my family, um, uh, and uh, uh, drifting off to sleep. And that the very next experience I have any awareness of, it will be of coming out of my grave at the, at the last judgment. Um, the survivalist obviously disagrees with that, right? And thinks that I'm gonna have a whole ton of experiences, disembodied experiences between those two points. Um, now, uh, I think, yeah, my soul will have experiences, right? Yeah, sure. Um, but not me. That's not me having those experiences. And I, I won't know uh, what any of that is, is like until, um, until I'm raised from, from the dead. Although, interestingly, because it's my soul and because in resurrection, the soul will be reunited with my body. Um, I will remember those experiences, which is a very strange thing, uh, will be a very strange thing. Um, I will remember them, but I can't remember them until I exist. Um, and I, right, I, I got, I have to exist again. And if that doesn't happen until the general resurrection. Okay, yeah, so that may, uh, you know, some people will say like, oh, that sounds crazy, but actually I was following with you the whole entire time. So yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, and, you know, I guess like one other thing I might want to talk about too really quick is just, you know, like, so obviously I don't think the survivalists are like substance dualists. Um, right. Right. They're not. But um, I guess uh, when a lot of people think about um, this question on the, you know, the, you know, the, the afterlife and what happens after we die, they think that, oh, well, like the real me, like is my soul or what have you. Right. And I just continue existing. Um so I just thought it would be nice if you could explain just what is the precise difference between the substance dualist and the survivalist? <laughs> Good. Um, so for a while, for a little bit, I actually wanted to entitle this dissertation, um, uh, 
against pseudo Cartesian dualism. <laughs> um, because I think, yes, it's certainly true that the Thomistic survivalists uh, claim no truck with the substance dualists, that they uh, claim to follow um, the, the substance monism of Thomas Aquinas. Um, and I take that affirmation at face value. I, I mean, part of what my project is trying to do, however, is to get them to, to see that their substance monism is ultimately incompatible with what they want to say about the interim state. And to tell me, well, if you want to, if you want to keep what you want to say about the interim state, if you'd like to keep that, um, if you want to keep your survivalism, tell me what part of Aquinas's uh, again, philosophy of nature, metaphysics, or philosophical anthropology you want to give up. Because I think you do have to give some important element of one or all three of those uh, parts of his doctrine up in order to hold on to survivalism. And part of me is kind of just curious to know, well, what, you know, what part do you want to give up? Now, um, Christopher Brown, who I believe is a uh, Eleanor Stump student has a great little book called uh, Aquinas and the Ship of Theseus, um, where he talks about what Aquinas would have to say about the, the, the famous Ship of Theseus problem and the surrounding problems of material constitution. And he does very briefly uh, touch on the uh, corruptionist survivalist uh, problem in that book. Uh, I can't remember at what page he does this, but he basically, he's the one, I mean, and he's been the most forthright as far as I can tell among all the survivalists and telling me what part he of, of Aquinas' doctrine he wants to give up. And um, he wants to give up that death is a substantial change, um, right? He wants to give up that death is a substantial change. And um, that's interesting. It's certainly uh, a way to go. I think, I, I can't remember exactly, but I think, um, I think Ed Fazer, it, in conversation told me that the part he wants to give up is that nothing can survive its own substantial corruption. Um, he wants to say that there's some things that can survive their own substantial corruption. Um, and, uh, but he's free to correct me on his blog if that's uh, not the case or no longer the case. Um, and I think those are very, whichever way you go on that, I, I think that is very in, it's, I'm just fascinated by finding out like what which part people want to give up on. Um, and I think it's an important question in part because once you give up on those things, um, you know, it's like pulling the thread of a sweater, right? I mean, it, it, it's not what you have to give up very well might not end there, right? Um, if you give up on the idea that substantial corruption is the destruction of the substance corrupted. Okay, well, now you owe me an account of why, you know, why we should think that other substances that could corrupt it don't survive their, uh, their corruption. Um, my advisor, Alex Proust, um, I have once got him to the point where he, he, he wasn't, he was unwilling to commit to the view that um, electrons don't survive their own corruption, um, that maybe they can go on living beyond their own, um, um, the loss of their own matter, um, and so on. Um, so it, 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 it can lead you to very interesting places, places that I think that ultimately become, it, that have the potential at least to become radical rejections of, uh, as I said, uh, Aquinas's philosophy of nature or philosophical anthropology. And the philosophical anthropology point is a really touchy, important one, because if you start giving up on things there, as maybe some people want to do, I, I think as, as many uh, survivalists want to do, they want to give up on the idea that the body is an essential part of me. They want to give up on the idea that I am a kind of body um, for Aquinas. I'm, I'm a very special kind of body. I'm the, I'm the uh, living, sensitive, rational body, but I'm a, but I'm a body. Um, and if you give up on that, um, 
then I do, I have re really big worries, worries that I spell out in the form of arguments in the dissertation about whether you're going to be able to maintain all the bioethical uh, claims that not only Aquinas would want to maintain, but that uh, we as Catholics want to maintain. Um, so I have two, two bioethical arguments in the dissertation, which uh, basically say that survivalists, um, that survivalists can't have the best account of what makes a parent a parent, um, for example, like of what the relationship is between parents and and their children, because they can't say, and I'm happy to go through these in um, step by step with with you, uh, depending on uh, what time allows. Um, that that parents uh, don't cause their children to exist, which I think influences how we see parenthood and parental authority, and also that survivalists cannot um, properly distinction distinguish between bioethically permissible amputations of um, uh, diseased limbs, for example, and euthanasia. Um, it, I had mentioned a little bit earlier uh, that Ed Fazer in one of his works um, characterizes death as a whole body amputation. Um, and I kind of turned that around on him uh, it, taking it quite seriously um, and saying, yeah, sure, right. Uh, for the survivalist, death is like a whole body amputation. So why can't we do some? Um, that's, a, that, that's a big concern for me, right? Of how we wanna say that um, amputations, even radical amputations that require cutting away a, a large part of the body, as long as it serves the, the, the health and welfare of the, of the larger substance are permissible, but that euthanasia is not permissible. And I, I, I don't think that the survivalists can ultimately give a coherent account of why amputations are permissible and euthanasia is not. Yeah, I mean, but, I was, I was yeah, thinking- Yeah, just that, I mean, the, the point there being, mm -hmm. this is not just a, an abstruse uh, debate between um, Thomas in the ivory tower. This does ultimately, um, uh, really um, have important ramifications for how we think about very concrete, very practical bioethical questions. Yeah, you know, when I was listening to you talk, I mean, as you know, like ethics, I mean, that's the thing that I really studied in college, you know, so that's like my wheelhouse. And I was thinking like, wait a minute, you know, like, um, I mean, I know that you were talking about how they're not, they, they claim to not be substance dualists, right? But I was listening to some of the arguments and running through the logic and I was like wait but I think you could start saying some pretty um uh, problematic things right if you don't hold to this very tight synthesis that's uh yeah, yeah. so I mean let's just walk through the arguments then because I'm interested in those given my sure. background um, yeah and I mean as far as the substance dualist accusation goes it's worth noting that at least among you know contemporary Christian substance dualists Hardly anybody's a substance dualist anymore because mm. they don't believe it, most people who go by the moniker substance dualist this, these days don't actually believe in two substances, one of the soul and one of the body, the way that Descartes arguably did. Um, they really only believe in one substance, the soul, mm. to which the body is annexed in some kind of accidental way, right? Where the body's a, kind of an accident or something like that, not an independent substance. Mm -hmm. And I think that is actually very close to the way that sur many survivalists ultimately are gonna be committed to characterizing the relationship between the soul and the body. Um, yeah. Um, so, okay, so I have, um, I, I gave one um, uh, interpretive argument for corruptionism already. Um, I have the two bioethical ones, one about parenthood, one about uh, euthanasia as a kind of amputation. Um, and then I have, uh, I have a part of my dissertation where I kind of do, um, um, I kind of do uh, uh, a rapid fire round of, of shorter arguments with a, a less defense um, behind them. Um, I take it you you're primarily want to talk about the bioethical ones, yeah? Yeah, sure. I mean, unless you like, um, but before we get there, I mean, are, is there anything 
um, more that should be said about the main body of the argument? Or do you think we could just move on to some of these other questions? Uh, yeah, no, I think we could, um, uh, we could move on at this point. Yeah. All right. So give me the argument about um, uh, the relationship between parent and child. Great. Yeah. Okay. Um, so here's that argument. Um, premise one, parents and children have certain obligations to each other that common sense tells us they do, right? Premise two, if parents and children have these certain obligations to each other that common sense tells us they do, then parents cause their children to exist. Um, three, therefore parents cause their children to exist, modus ponens, one and two. Um, four, if survivalism is true, uh, parents do not cause their children to exist. Uh, five, therefore, survivalism is false. Um, so uh, a lot of this argument um, actually gets into the weeds of why the best account of uh, the source of parental obligations is a causal account. There's a number of accounts of parenthood and parental obligation in the literature, uh, which are fascinating in their own right. Um, uh, but I defend a view on which, you know, what makes somebody a parent is that they cause their children to exist in the right kind of way, right? Um, uh, namely through the um, exercise of a sexual faculty and so on. Um, and this is something, this is an account of parenthood that I think the survivalists just can't take advantage of. Right, uh, because what they believe, right, very importantly, what they believe um, about human persons is that the soul alone is sufficient to constitute a human person, right? Such that even if you don't have a body, as long as you have a soul, you have a human person there. The, the soul isn't identical to the human person, but the soul is sufficient to constitute a human person without a body. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, something else that Christians uh, very often uh, believe, right, is that uh, most Christians that I'm aware of, at least, right, is that parents do not cause the souls of their children to exist, right? That's not how one becomes a parent, right? The soul of human beings, uh, according to almost all Christians who have ever lived, Protestant or Catholic, um, comes immediately from God and is specially created by God and infused into the uh, the body at the moment of conception, as as we now understand from contemporary biology and uh, philosophical anthropology. Or if you're Aquinas, right, 40 days after conception in the case of males and 80 days after in the case of females, which uh, whether you believe in delayed hominization is totally um, immaterial to my point, which is just that um, Parents don't cause their, uh, the souls of their children to exist. God alone does that, right? Um, and I, um, I rely on another principle here um, that basically says that if you cause the, um, if you cause uh, something that is sufficient for X to exist, to exist, then you cause X to exist, right? Um, so uh, I don't think there's, uh, I call that principle causal transitivity, right? Uh, here's a more uh, explicit statement of it. I just pulled it up. If S alone causes X to exist and the existence of X fully grounds the existence of Y, then S alone causes Y to exist. I think that has a lot of intuitive force. Uh, I definitely welcome anybody to send me an email with a counterexample that they can think of. I, I, I've taken this part of the dissertation to a number of conferences at this point and haven't heard any good counterexamples thus far, nor indeed have I heard anybody even claim that they don't believe the principle, um, right? And it, what it would require you to believe, right, is that you, you think that somebody could cause something to exist which fully grounds another entity without thereby causing that other entity to exist. I think if there were, if the principle did fail to hold in general, um, we'd have a lot of other problems where people could escape moral responsibility for causing things that they clearly caused. Um, 
merely because they didn't cause that thing directly. They only caused the thing which fully grounds the, that other thing. Um, and so the idea here, the, the importance of causal transitivity is if God causes the human soul to exist, as almost all Christians have historically held, and the human soul fully grounds the existence of a human person, as survivalists tell us uh, it does, um, then God alone causes human persons to exist, which of course rolls out the possibility that parents cause uh, their children to exist, right? Um, what that means is that survivalists can't have what I think is the best and most popular account of parenthood. And because they can't have the best and most popular account of parenthood, um, uh, they have to contend with adopting some other account. Um, and even if one doesn't think that the causal account of parenthood is ultimately correct, and that some other uh, account of parenthood would suffice, I think at the very least, it's a very strange price to pay for being a survivalist, right? That it turns out you have to uh, change your theory of parenthood and parental obligation. Um, and obviously, you know, I don't, I don't get too far into this because it's a dissertation on metaphysics, not ethics. Um, but um, who knows what the ultimate ethical ramifications are of changing our account of parenthood, right? Um, if you change the account of parenthood, you change the account of parent parental obligation and of, 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 of the, the account of obligations that parents have to children and also the account of uh, obligations that children have to parents. Um, and who knows what kinds of common intuitions we have about parental or filial obligation that such a switch in account might end up falsifying. I mean, that's obviously something to be hashed out among people who work in the literature of parenthood and parental obligation. But if survivalists end up all being forced away from the causal account uh, to some other account, um, then it's worth realizing that they inherit all the problems that may come with that account um, and need to answer them. Um, and at any rate, um, what I think is important, I had mentioned earlier that Patrick Toner um, is kind of in a sense the, the forefather of this contemporary debate. Um, lots of other folks have jumped in. Eleanor Stump has some work on, on it. Um, David Oderberg, uh, uh, Edward Fazer all have uh, uh, some things written that at least touch upon this debate. Um, what is, um, I guess, important about this piece of the dissertation is that it's an entirely original new argument for corruptionism. Uh, and it's, as far as I'm aware, also the first bioethical argument against survivalism, uh, right? It's the first argument being made from bioethics against survivalism. All the other arguments that I'm aware of in the literature thus far have been arguments from, uh, you know, philosophical anthropology, metaphysics, philosophy of nature. Yeah, so I had like three questions uh, pop up in my head. And so I'm going to try to remember what all three of them were. Um, so the first question I had was just, um, you know, with parental obligation, let's say having it rooted in the causal account, right? And, you know, you can hash this out in more detail. But I mean, what about, let's say, a child who is raised by his or her adopted parents or, you know, a step parent in the relationship? You know, what happens with parental obligation? Right. Yeah. So when I say that the causal account is the best account of parental obligation, I don't mean in saying that to rule out uh, that adoptive parents or parents um, or, or anything like that, uh, but just that the causal account is the, is the correct account of the, the fundamental core idea of parenthood as defined by the, the normal biological relationship. Now, um, once you have that concept um, and a causal account for it, um, it obviously makes sense, as we do with many other concepts, to extend the concepts for a variety of different reasons to extraordinary cases, including uh, the case of adoption, where we want to say that adoptive parents are true parents. Yes, of course. Um, uh, but they are uh, parents by analogy to 
uh, and it, when I say by analogy, I don't mean uh, not really, I just mean by analogy, right? Um, by analogy to the core concept of parenthood, which is accounted for in causal terms. Um, so, you know, adoptive parents are, are, are parents and true parents um, because they play the role of parents. Um, but um, obviously we would have no concept of adoptive parenthood if it weren't for the original core concept of biological parenthood, right? It doesn't, wouldn't make any sense to think of adoption if, if there weren't such a thing as biological parenthood. And um, that concept of biological parenthood is one that I, I argue is best accounted for in terms of the causal, uh, causal relationship between parents and, and biological offspring. Yeah. All right, here's my second question. Um, so a lot, I think a lot of people would maybe ground parental obligation and even the obligations that a child has to his or her parent uh, parents on the basis of, let's say something like a, you know, like a risk principle or something like that. So for instance, um, you know, your mom and dad formed you, right. And you're born, right. And now you're, you're in a vulnerable situation because you're on your own, you know, like uh, you were brought into right. this world without your consent, right. And all this. And so, you know, your parents owe it to you because they put you in that situation to take care of you until you're able to be autonomous and independent. Right. And then I guess in turn, you would have obligations to your parent uh, so, so long as they are fulfilling that part of, you know, so long as there's like that reciprocity of care um, mm -hmm. and maintenance. Now, why is that account inadequate? Right. So just to answer that question, I, I guess it, it, it's worth talking about the other three accounts that I actually address sure. in, the, mm -hmm. in this chapter. Um, one is uh, genetic accounts. You know, parents are parents because they're the source of the genetic material of the of the child. Uh, another uh, that that is very close to the kind of account you just gave are, are called gestational uh, or or labor accounts on which parents are parents because they gestate the child or invest uh, a great deal of labor uh, uh, into the child um, early on in life. And then finally, there are intentional or voluntarist accounts, which ought also bear the account you just gave is kind of a hybrid of the labor account slash intentional or voluntarist account. Mm -hmm. On intentional and voluntarist accounts, parents are parents in virtue of intending to become parents um, or of willingly accepting uh, the role of a parent. Um, the problem with both, you know, one problem with the kind of account you just spelled out, let's just bring it back to that. Um, is that, uh, well, I mean, if, if what you're gonna say is that parents are parents because of the labor that they invest early on in their children, children's lives, in their children, right? Then I think that gets our intuitions precisely backwards about what's wrong with deadbeat parents, um, right? The parent who abandons their child from birth, right? On that kind of account would just, they wouldn't be a bad parent, they'd be a non-parent, right? If the theory is that what makes one a parent is that original uh, investment of labor or the intention to take on uh, a parental role uh, early in the child's life. Um, well then, you know, deadbeat parents aren't bad parents as we'd like to say they are, they're non-parents. Um, and that I think is the wrong conclusion. We wanna say that deadbeat parents are bad parents, not that they're non-parents. All right, that makes sense to me. Um, and then you already described the other three accounts that you were um, tackling in the paper. Is that correct? Or was there- uh, Yeah, one? those are the account. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, I can say more about why I think each of those accounts are insufficient. And I, I, I should just advertise at this point, right? Like now I'm kind of like, you know, surveying a huge literature at sure. 30,000 feet and saying very conclusive things. My, the main thrust of the argument is just to get survivalists to come to the table and, and say why mm -hmm. the argument either fails or, or, or to uh, say what their account of parenthood is and why it works. Um, but just to briefly kind of say why each account is, is wrong. The genetic accounts on which parents are parents because they derive their uh, their children children derive their genes from their parents. I think uh, 
faces problems with explaining why identical uh, twins and clones don't stand in parental relations, right? Because identical twins also derive their genes from their twin and clones derive their genes from the person clone. Um, more also, uh, something that's a particular problem for the survivalist is that uh, genetic accounts might not hold up after death, right? If my genes are what make me my parents' son, then if I lose my body uh, and therefore my genes, am I still their son? Well, we would certainly like to say so, right? Um, my mother, uh, God rest her soul, has been dead for three years now. I, I still pray for her and talk about her and think about her as my mother. Um, I, I'd like to think she still is my mother, despite it, if the survivalist is right, right? Um, if the survivalist is right and my mother still exists, um, I'd really like to think she's still my mother, <laughs> um, right? Um, and on the genetic account, it's not clear that I could say that, right? Uh, it, because it, she lost a thing that made her my mother, uh, it, it seems, it seems. Um, gestational and other uh, labor accounts, again, right, make a, pa a parent becomes a parent on this account in virtue of gestating uh, the child or uh, investing labor into the in, into the child early on. Um, I think uh, this is maybe it might actually be sufficient for uh, ha having uh, parental or parental esque obligations to a child, but the important thing is it's it's not necessary uh, for the reason that I just explained. Right, we don't want to say that deadbeat parents are non-parents. We want to say that they're bad parents. Um, so yes, uh, I can grant uh, that gestation or investment of labor early in a child's life makes you a parent. Uh, I can just grant that and say, nevertheless, this this account is insufficient. It, it, it's not. It's it's a bad account because it lets uh, deadbeat parents off the hook as non-parents rather than the bad parents that we want to say they are. And then intentional. Um, uh, oh, it, with respect to gestational and other labor accounts, I think it also gets the order of explanation wrong. Parents gestate and labor for their children because they're parents, not the other way around, right? Like, um, I don't have any children yet, but I ho hope to soon. And it, when I do have children, I'm going to um, wake up in the middle of the night and feed them and change their diapers because they're my children not because I'm trying to become their father, right? Because I already am their father. Um, finally, intentional and voluntarist accounts vest parental obligations in those who intend to be parents or willingly accept such a role and the obligations it carries. This again, uh, faces the, the same kind of uh, um, the same kind of objection I, from deadbeat parents that I already mentioned. It, it absolves unintending procreators from parental obligation. We don't want to do that. Um, and the other problem, I think, is it also cannot ground other uh, involuntary familial obligations, such as those borne by siblings, grandparents, etc. Let me say for a moment what I uh, mean by that. So uh, obviously, the parent-child relationship is the is the font of all other familial relationships, right? You can't you can't be in relationship with anybody unless somebody gives uh, gives birth to them, right? So it's in virtue of the parent-child relationship that we have all the other familial relationships that we do. Those of grandparents, siblings, cousins, all of that is born of the parent-child relationship. Um, and so one of the desiderata I think we ought to have for the parent-child relationship is that what we say about that relationship and the obligations it generates ought to also explain where the other kinds of familial obligations come from, right? Um, and I don't think the intentional or voluntarist account can do that, right? So we think, for example, that grandparents have obligations to their grandchildren. Um, and on the causal account, the reason for that is pretty straightforward. They're the cause of their grandchildren. There are more remote cause than the parents, and therefore their obligations are um, less intense. Um, but they are nevertheless a cause, and therefore they have um, obligations to their grandchildren. Um, 
the intentional and voluntarist accounts, I don't think can ground that, right? Because obviously, although many people intend to become parents, a very few people intend to become grandparents. Uh, um, and, and they don't usually sign up for it, right? Uh, likewise with siblings, right? We think siblings have obligations to each other. On the causal account, I think that's very easy to, to explain. We have, you. if you're my brother, you have obligations to me because we have a common cause, right? Um, on intentional or voluntarist accounts, uh, it's not clear why I would have obligations to my brother, right? I didn't sign up to be a brother. Um, I didn't uh, intend to become a brother, um, right? So I think the best account of parenthood uh, has to be one on which the kinds of intuitions to which we're appealing to give that account can ultimately transfer over to explain other kinds of familial obligations we think we have. And it's just not going to work with the intentional or voluntarist account because most of the familial obligations we have are not intentional, not voluntary. We're stuck with family that we never intended or, or wanted to have, um, but that but to whom we nevertheless have obligations. You know, and I was just thinking about too, like if you begin your account of let's say parenthood from giving, going off of what I was saying, right? Um, just like, you know, hey, you put me in this vulnerable spot. I didn't ask to exist. I'm like, wow, that's going to be a toxic start for your, your relationship with your parents and your family, you know? So that doesn't even sound like a morally good starting point. But anyway, here's a third question I have on this um, objection to survivalism or ramification. And then we can get to the second one and we can probably wrap up from there. Okay. So my third question is, um, so you, you know, so basically it sounds as if um, the body on survivalism is accidental to the person. That's what it sounds like, right? Maybe they won't want to say that, but that's what it yeah. sounds like. Okay. Right. So you mentioned that the ramification of this is that when we give an account of, let's say, you know, parents creating their child and, and, you know, you know, they're giving, they're giving birth, um, what exactly so i remember you said something like god creates the whole human person right because you know he creates the soul um so then on the survivalist account at least what are you saying is the role of the parent in the well in the, the yeah yeah good that's a good question so yeah. on the corruptionist account i defend what i say is the role of the parent is that you the parent parents cause their children to be right mm -hmm. period the survivalist i think has to say only that the parents cause their children to be bodily. Yeah, okay. They, they cause their children to have a body. Um, one important uh, ramification that has is that you, you might be able to then say why parents have uh, obligations to, to um, support and care for their children's bodies because they're the source of that. They're the causal source of that. But of course, we don't think that parental obligations end with, end with, or even begin with, for that matter, bodily, um, bodily care, right? And we actually think that the most important obligations that parents have to their children are for their children's souls uh, and for their spiritual welfare. Um, and uh, unless the parent is the cause, is the, is the cause of the child's existence, period, I don't think we can account for those kinds of obligations. All right. I'm going to ask a question of my own, and then we'll get to your second, uh, you know, uh, observation on full body amputation euthanasia. Right. But I sure. mean, so this is a question that I have, Christopher. So, you know, um, I'm doing my prayers, right. Especially during Lent. Right. And I'm asking for the intercession of St. Thomas Aquinas, who is right now in heavenly beatitude. Um, right. Now, Am I praying to St. Thomas or am I just praying to the soul of St. Thomas? Right. Yeah. Very, <laughs> this is a well-known objection to corruptionist corruptionism. Well, I, I won't give you my answer. I'll give you Thomas Aquinas's answer, which is that you are indeed praying to St. Thomas's soul and not to St. Thomas. Um, uh, let me just pull up the question where he addresses this. Um, I also like how this is a particularly Catholic line of questioning. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, uh, 
Here we go. Um, yeah. So uh, those of those of your viewers who want to like go read St. Thomas say this for himself um, should go to the Secundus Kunde Pars um, question. 83, it's the question on prayer. Article 11, do the saints in heaven pray for us? Uh, and then go to objection five, which reads as follows. Further, the soul of Peter is not Peter. If therefore the souls of the saints pray for us, so long as they are separated from their bodies, we ought not to call upon St. Peter, but on his soul to pray for us. Yet the church does the contrary, and so do all of we, right? The saints, therefore, do not pray for us, at least before the resurrection. So the, that's the objection. So the objection is as thoroughgoing a corruptionist objection as one could possibly get. Um, and here's how uh, Thomas answers it, right? And it, it's important to note, as I read his response to this objection, that obviously if he was a survivalist, the obvious response is to say, no, we, uh, ne even though the soul of Peter is, is not Peter, nevertheless, Peter had survived and therefore you may call upon him. It's uh, needless to say, that's not the way he responds. Um, here's how he responds. Reply to objection five. It is because the saints while living merited to pray for us that we invoke them under the names by which they were known in this life and by which they are better known to us. And also in order to indicate our belief in the resurrection, according to the saying of Exodus 3, 6, I am the God of Abraham, etc. cetera. Um, obviously, if he were survivalist, he ought to have just said, yes, the soul of Peter is not Peter, but you can still call upon Peter because Peter's up there with his soul. Uh, being constituted by his soul, not what he says. So I, I actually think this is by itself, a, from an interpretive point of view, a knockdown argument for corruptionism. Um, but um, uh, the important point is that uh, uh, what to answer your question, like, what, what, are you are you praying to the soul of? Uh, do you, are you praying to Saint Thomas or are you praying to his soul? Well, he thinks you're praying to his soul but that you call his soul St. Thomas, because what else are you going to call, right? I mean, what are you going to go through your whole life saying the soul of St. Thomas pray for me? That's um, a little long-winded for one thing. Um, uh, and also that, look, I mean, it's true, the soul of St. Pete, the soul of St. Thomas is not St. Thomas, but obviously the relationship between the two is very intimate. Um, and if anything other than St. Thomas deserves to be called St. Thomas, it's his soul, right? Um, and so, uh, yeah, we still call his soul St. Thomas um, uh, because it's the soul of St. Thomas. Uh, this is a common linguistic shortcut called synecdoche that we engage in all the time, right? You can watch your 11 o'clock news and hear things like, the White House signed a bill today authorizing blah, 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 blah. Um, does, does the White House sign bills? No, uh, right? The, the president inside the White House signs bills. Um, uh, and many other examples. I'm bad at coming up with examples. No, that was actually a really good one. Yeah, but yeah, um... uh, but you know, it's a linguistic shortcut that we engage in all the time. And um, here's the other important point. Okay. Uh, which mm -hmm. goes more to the heart of the worry, I think, which is, well, I'd really like St. Thomas to pray for me, right? Um, you're, you're, you're giving me the, uh, the soul of St. Thomas. And, but here's the important thing. Like, okay, I mean, when you're praying to St. Thomas and you're asking him to pray for you or to intercede for you, are you seeking anything from St. Thomas that you think his soul could not equally well do, right? Um, usually when we're asking for the intercession of the saints, we're asking them to pray for us. Okay, well, the soul of St. Thomas is just as good at praying for you as St. Thomas is, right? Um, it, when it comes to things like prayer, it, I mean, it, I guess it would be a different story. It would be a very different story if I was asking, 
uh, St. Thomas, please run uh, a, fi uh, a 5K for me. St. Thomas, please eat this pizza for me. St. Thomas, come down and have a beer with me. All of those would be problems for the soul of St. Thomas. He can't, the soul of St. Thomas can't do any of those things. Um, but uh, what we're usually asking the saints to do for us is to pray for us. And the souls of the saints are just as good at prayer as the saints themselves were. Um, and so there's the point here being, um, if this is in terms of this being an objection to corruptionism, I think it fails primarily because um, what we want out of the communion of the saints in terms of on the ground concrete uh, spiritual help from the, the, from the blessed souls uh, does not in any way, shape or form depend on whether the entity to which we're praying is the person who actually died or their soul. Um, and because what we want from them uh, can be equally well performed by either the person who died or his or her soul. All right, so basically, even though I'm not praying to St. Thomas, the person, uh, you know, in, per the, in person, the person, his soul can still do the job that I want it to do by virtue of his whole, uh, his merits and so on and so forth. Or Right. And also, in, mm. and also because that soul is going to, um, you know, uh, that soul knows who St. Thomas is. Uh, yeah, yeah. What kind of relationship it has to St. Thomas um, knows why, folks like you or I would be calling upon, uh, calling upon him and so forth. Um, it's not as if he's kind of clueless, <laughs> right, about uh, sure. what, what he is or, or what his relationship is to St. Thomas or, or why people would be calling upon him. Um, I, I, I'm using a personal pronoun there, him, to refer to the soul, but it's important to remember, of course, the soul is not a person. Mm -hmm. So pr most properly speaking, it, it, I would say it. Mm -hmm. um, now, of course, all of this sounds very strange. And uh, it might sound so strange that you think, uh, you know, it's just not worth it. I'm going to go with the survivalist. Um, one thing to say about that is it's supposed to be strange, right? We as creatures are strange. We are, right, this um, uh, amphibian living between the 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 watery world of uh, corporeal things and the earthly world uh, the, the earthy world of of spiritual things right uh, we are metaphysical amphibians as many Thomists mm -hmm. have routinely noted in this way right and not only are we metaphysical amphibians in this way that would lead lead us to expect strange results when we're substantially corrupted but we're also we're metaphysical amphibians that were never meant to die right that we die in the first place um is an accident of um is an accident of of our fall mm -hmm. um and so that we find strange results in the interim state such as that there are you know souls running around that really look like persons but aren't quite persons and so on um is i think not too surprising when we consider that a we're met metaphysical amphibians and b we were never meant to die mm -hmm. right that, mm -hmm. it's a it's a not a state that was supposed to ever occur um so we shouldn't be surprised when we find weird things going on there and the last thing that on, on this particular question that occurred to me and this is not really a question but just an observation um I mean, the beauty of the fact that Mary was assumed body and soul into heaven. And so it's like when I'm praying to, you know, mom, <laughs> it's not right. to the soul of mom um, alone, but it's like it's to mom herself. I mean, that's just like giving, I mean, giving her her due. Right. But I mean, I, I just yes. that, that that occurred to me. Do you have any thoughts yeah. on that? Yeah, no, I, I, I do have uh, thoughts on that. So I think in that sense, corruptionism is uniquely situated to explain the motive for the assumption um in the sense that you know wh why does why does christ assume uh either why does christ either never let mary die or eh, on the eastern tradition resurrect her soon after her death and assume her body and soul into heaven is be uh, well uh 
because it, otherwise she wouldn't exist and, until until he resurrects her. Um, that I think makes better sense of the kind of scriptural um, allusions that Catholic, Catholics typically make um, in order to justify the assumption, right? I, I will not let my beloved see corruption as one of the famous uh, scriptural allusions for the assumption. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, uh, corruptionism makes good sense out of that. Of course, the survivalists can say, oh, well, you know, Christ wanted his mother to have her body, um, which is a fine thing to say, but it's not quite as uh, um, motivating a thing to say as Christ wanted his mother to to still exist. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, and more generally, um, more generally, uh, it's, I think corruptionism makes better sense of um, the resurrection and what, what God, the, the imp very important good work that God is doing for us in the resurrection, right? He's not just giving us our bodies back. He's, he's giving us our existence back. Um, and that both, I think, explains better why the resurrection is necessary in the first place. Um, and also uh, gives God um, a greater glory in the sense of assigning to him a much greater work so to speak, uh, being accomplished in the resurrection, the general resurrection. Yeah, I totally agree. And, you know, it's kind of funny. I'm, I'm just, I can feel my mind being blown right now as I'm like reevaluating, you know, like the ways that I used to think about the afterlife and resurrection. I'm like, oh, wow. Like, and, yeah. You know, and you know, I mean, I think, yeah. I, I think that the old Testament, and this is one thing Alex Proust did agree with me on is that, that if, if we were um, just reading the old Testament, it comes across extremely corruptionist. Yeah, yeah. He, he mm -hmm. says that it does. That, that that right. I mean that that you die and that's that's the end. And hopefully there's a resurrection. We really hope there is because that's the only hope we have of of surviving death. Um. Uh. So uh, and I think I think that's yeah. I mean it's certainly um. As with well. I'll draw a parallel here to my work on the doctrine of divine simplicity, which is to say, contrary to, you know, detractors of that doctrine, I feel as though my belief in the doctrine of divine simplicity has greatly enhanced my prayer and spiritual life. Think, seeing, uh, understanding God as 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 he as he is has made me love him even more. And um, uh, Corruptionism sounds like a, a, a dour doctrine. <laughs> doesn't sound very fun. Who wants? Who who doesn't want to survive their death? Um, uh, but I think uh, that too, at least for me, I can only speak for myself, um, has led me to a greater appreciation of um, the resurrection of Christ and uh, a greater hope in my own resurrection. Um, and a great a greater gratitude to god for the gift of resurrection yeah in the end it's like god's gonna give me back you know what i'm saying like right. i'll be back you know it's like it's something greater is gonna be you know um yeah compared to the vision of just i just got my body back it's like no i'm going to be back finally you know yeah like, and i i, I mean it, and it fits we're in the season of lent uh, yeah. i think it fits well right with with um with what God says to Adam in Genesis um, mm -hmm. after after the fall, you are dust and to dust you will return, right? It's not you are dust and a dusty part you will lose before going on to a spiritual life. You are dust and to dust you will return. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, this is all rather conclusory as a matter of scriptural exegesis, sure. but I think... And I'm a philosopher, you know, right? Um, but um, I think it—I think it all fits together. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, before we move on to the argument, uh, very briefly from um, euthanasia, mm -hmm. one thing that doesn't fit so well 
with corruptionism, theologically speaking, is that because corruptionism says that there are no human persons in the interim state, and because Catholic doctrine says that purgatory is an interim state only affair, uh, corruptionism therefore does on Catholic doctrine entail that no human person ever goes to purgatory, um, which is an untoward, it, it sounds like an untoward um, conclusion. Um, this is, a pro as I account it, the, pro the most serious problem for the view, um, because largely because at, at least um, as most, uh, most of the church's spiritual and pastoral tradition attests, right? Um, I want to avoid going to purgatory, right? And, and preachers throughout the church's history, writers, uh, spiritual writers throughout the church's history have never said, oh, well, don't sweat it. Um, you, it's metaphysically impossible for you to go to purgatory. They've said, no, gain indulgences, um, you know, do good works, uh, avoid sin so that you uh, need not go to purgatory. Um, and so uh, for it to turn out to be a matter of pure metaphysics that I don't go to purgatory <laughs> um, puts, uh, puts all that spiritual tradition in a very awkward light. Um, so uh, this is actually one of the reasons I got interested in the project though, is because I think that the church actually has been speaking out, out of both sides of her mouth, so to speak, for the past two millennia um, on, um, on this issue saying, hey, here's the, meta here's the metaphysics of the human person, but then also speaking on the spiritual side of things as if purgatory is something that human persons can go to. Um, and I think the church, at least the magisterium, let's put it that way, um, has, has never really addressed that tension, has not seen that tension, um, properly speaking. And here's kind of just my like off the cuff, um, amateur church historian view of, of, of how we found ourselves in that weird position, right? Because obviously the, the church adopts Aquinas' metaphysics and philosophical anthropology as her own, uh, in the, in the, uh, at least certainly by the Council of Trent, fully endorsing all that, but never gives up, right, the idea, well, among other things, doesn't give up uh, the invocation of the saints, of course, uh, th th this robust idea of the communion of saints where I'm in relationship with the saints themselves, at least that's the way we seem to speak, and also the idea that I, the person, may end up going to purgatory and that I'd like to avoid it and I should take measures to avoid it. And I think part of what's going on there is that um, although the church adopted by the Council of Trent Aquinas's philosophy, um, and philosophical anthropology, philosophy of nature, metaphysics, and so on, um, she never gave up more ancient um, um, liturgical and paraliturgical practices that were predicated on earlier Platonic understandings of the human person that we got from Augustine and others. Um, so I think part of what's going on here is that certain traditions develop on the Platonic metaphysics of the church as championed by Augustine and others, including the communion of the saints, including the doctrine of purgatory, and then Aquinas comes along with all these things already kind of, you know, in place, right? And says, now let's go with the Aristotelian view of Hume, of philosophical anthropology. And the church then subsequently says, yeah, okay, Aquinas, good idea. Let's do that. Without realizing that there's a tension between these liturgical and paraliturgical um, practices that she's long endorsed and carried on um, because those liturgical and paraliturgical practices are predicated on an earlier metaphysics, platonic metaphysics of the human person that she has officially at least given up. Um, and, it, and she just doesn't see it, uh, uh, which I find to be like a fascinating thesis because it, it, it's, it's like, there's this, <laughs> There's this um, weird ticking time bomb 
in the development of the church's theology, where the metaphysicians are not speaking to the preachers and the spiritual authors. Um, and there's at least a, a prima facie tension between what the two sides are saying. Um, and I think that the issue with purgatory fits into, fits into that category. Although I will note there is one part in the commentary on the sentences where Aquinas seems to notice this tension himself. I don't have the text in front of me right now. Um, so those who are in interested enough to reach out to me can do so and I'll, I'll, I'll hunt it down for them. Where he says basically that the punishment of the person uh, with respect to purgatory is the like, what does it mean for me to be punished, um, given his metaphysics? Uh, well, what he says is, my punishment comes in parts. Uh, the punishment of the body is that I, um, my body um, decays and rots in the ground. And the punishment of my soul is that it has to go to purgatory. And what he seems to think, given this text in the commentary on the sentences, is that those two punishments together, uh, the punishment of my body and the punishment of my soul, constitute the punishment of me, even though I, strictly speaking, don't experience anything. That's the way I read it, at least. That's a very controversial reading. I'm sure that the other survivalists and corruptionists in the literature, as far as I can tell, have never addressed that passage. Um, uh, but it, it is at least an indication that he seemed to be aware of the aware of the problem. Yeah, and you know it's interesting. I mean, that just reminds me. I've been thinking about this the whole time. But like in Revelation, uh, chapter twenty, verse fourteen, it talks about how death and Hades, or death and hell, are cast into the lake of fire. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it, and the Bible says this is the second death, right? So I mean, you know. Um, you know, I mean, I know there are different ways you can interpret it, but I just always thought it was weird. Like hell is thrown into the lake of fire. So like hell is thrown into hell. What? Like right. I always thought that was weird, but I mean, I guess that, that there, there's something that makes sense of it. But um, the other thing that you mentioned about like how in the Jewish tradition, at least with the Old Testament, right, is that, you know, the idea of the ancient Jews is that if you died, you just, that was kind of it. And then you mm -hmm. just wait for the resurrection to come back. But once you're dead, you're dead, right? Yeah, assuming, like, assuming you were one of the Jews who even believed in a resurrection, right. which not all the Jews did. True. Yeah. And when I was listening to that, I was just like, yeah, I mean, with the, with my historical interest, you know, I was listening to that, like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense of, um, you know, that, that particular worldview or, or view of the afterlife, this, this, you know, philosophy you proposed. So I just thought that was really fascinating to see history and philosophy intersect quite well. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm very glad to hear that it matches your, cause I know, you know, a lot more about the Bible than I do as I'm very glad to hear that it matches your reading of the old Testament. That's that. Yeah. Glad to hear that. All right. Well, Christopher, uh, let's get to this uh, last one about a full body amputation and euthanasia. Sure. Yeah. I shouldn't have sounded so happy saying that, okay. <laughs> but like, yeah, let's get to this topic. <laughs> um, yeah. So this is, as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, actually inspired by um, a, a text, a, a way that uh, Edward Fazer has repeatedly characterized death, both on his blog and in his, um, and uh, in his uh, published work. I'll, I'll read the I'll read the quotation here from his, his 2018 chapter um, in, I think it's the Blackwell Companion to Substance Dualism. Yeah, it is that. It, and he has, the, he has the chapter in there on Aquinas on the soul, um, <clears throat> where he says, quote, hence, when human body is destroyed, it doesn't follow that the uh, human being is destroyed, that the substance is destroyed. It is not destroyed any more than a dog is destroyed when you reduce it to its vegetative functions. Rather, it continues on as a radically incomplete substance, as the stub of a human being, reduced to the bare minimum consistent with there being a human being at all. The difference with the case of the dog is that whereas the bare minimum consistent with there being a dog is something corporeal, the bare minimum consistent with there being a human being is something incorporeal. It is the human substance reduced to its intellective and volitional functions with all the corporeal functions being prevented from manifesting. That is why for us, 
unlike dogs, death is not the end. Death is more like an amputation than it is like annihilation. It is, quote, it is a, quote, full body amputation, end quote, as it were. Um, and that's the end of uh, the block quotation from Phaser. Um, so, um, you know, I'd read Phaser say this many times um, and it got me to thinking, okay, yeah, let's, let's say that they're right. Let's say it is like a full body amputation. What would follow? Well, amputations are generally something that we uh, uh, think are at least in principle morally permissible in the natural law tradition, yeah. Um, and so um, what, what, would, uh, what would flow from this? And here's the argument I came up with. Premise one, if survivalism is true, then whole body amputations are possible. Premise two, if whole body amputations are possible, then some whole body amputations are permissible. Three, if some whole body amputations are permissible, then active euthanasia is not intrinsically evil. Premise four, active euthanasia euthanasia is intrinsically evil. Uh, five, therefore, survivalism is false. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I just stated it formally, but it, it suffices certainly for our purposes at the moment with time running short and, uh, um, and with the, just given the nature of the argument to, to note that, okay, well, right. I mean, if you say that death is like a whole body amputation, why can't we do some, right? Um, why would it be impermissible to do some? And it's important here, let me just say like something in defense of premise two, which I think is the most controversial premise, right? That if whole body amputations are possible, then at least some are permissible. Why would we think that? Well, let's think for a moment about the way in which amputation is generally um, uh, justified in the natural law tradition, right? There um, is a, a, a principle that's generally appealed to in this context called the principle of totality, right? According to which cutting away the parts of a thing, including the parts of a human being uh, is permissible as long as it's at the service of saving the total thing. Right? That's why we call it the principle of totality, right? To, to, save, the, to save the whole, I may, uh, destroy parts, right, is the idea behind it. Very intuitive principle, certainly one um, that I may think makes a lot of sense to people and to, on which we are at least implicitly acting in many cases, um, maybe without even realizing that we're acting on a principle like that. Um, but if we take the whole in question to be the person and we take the body not to be identical with the person, as I think we ought to, right? Where the, where the form of the body is the human soul, but rather take it merely to be a part and, and, and a, the kind of part uh, that can be separated away from the person without destroying the person. Then I don't see any reason why the principle of totality would not permit us to do so, at least in some cases. Here's a kind of case that I have in, have in mind. The kind of case that proponents of legal euthanasia use all the time, right? Uh, terminally ill cancer patient, zero hope of recovery, um, facing down a lot of pain um, uh, to, uh, to be followed only by inevitable death, right? Just whole bodies riddled with stage four cancer in a lot of pain. Um, well, if you're a survivalist in this kind of situation, I think something that it makes a lot of sense to say, if you say, what's the problem here? How can we solve it from a, from a kind of medical point of view, right? Well, the problem is the whole body at that point, right? At that point in the stage of the disease, the problem is the whole body. It wouldn't suffice to cut away this part or that part um, or, or any given part. The whole body has to go. And that's precisely like what we have in mind when we say that some cancers are inoperable, right? If your doctor comes and tells you that cancer is inoperable, what he means is I can't take it out without killing you, right? Um, and uh, my point here is basically like, well, what's wrong with killing you, right? Um, if in fact you, the person, are going to survive uh, that death, that killing, 
Um, and it's going to save you a great deal of pain in the meantime. And the body's not really of any ongoing use to you anyway, because it's so diseased, then why not cut away the whole body, so to speak, right? Thus allowing the person uh, to move on in a, in a condition free of pain um, and without the body that is uh, dragging them down and uh, uh, was useless to them anyway because it was so riddled with disease. Mm -hmm. um, in that case, I think it makes sense to say, well, the whole thing here is the, is the human person. The part that is being problematic is the whole body that part is only that and that part is an accidental part that we can safely cut away without destroying the person um then why not let, yeah what what moral objection remains to doing it I, I i don't i don't see how you could say that there is one um uh, at least not in the categorical way that the natural law tradition wants to do, right? You could maybe rule out most of the cases. You, you could say you rule out many of them, but I think there's inevitably going to be some that you couldn't rule out that are going to be justified by exactly the same kind of bioethical reasoning that we use to justify cutting people's arms or legs or whatever else off. Um, uh, and at the very least, I think what this kind of argument uh, forces the survivalists to do is to come to the table and explain to us what theory, what bioethical theory they're using that permits all the amputations that we'd like to do, uh, but categorically forbids as intrinsically evil active euthanasia, which is also what the natural law tradition, those who are proponents of the natural law tradition would like to do. Yeah, and just a few thoughts, and then I'll ask a question. I mean, one thing I remember reading, and I think it was David Oderberg's work or in a conversation I had with another friend, but, you know, like when people talk about, well, like, wouldn't it just be better for the person if they died, right? Um, well, one is that, like, you know, usually, you know, I'm you know, if you're dealing with an atheist or a materialist and they're using this language in an ethical conversation, it's like, well, you don't even believe that they're going anywhere, so there's nothing better for that person. But then if I'm dealing with a Christian, who let's say is a survivalist or, you know, a substance dualist, um, you know, another context, right. Um, then I'm like, well, I mean, that is then something you have to consider. Like, wouldn't it be better for that person to just lose their body? Right. But like it exists in a state in which they're in, uh, they're incorporeal, but without pain. Right? right. And so, you know, I just, I, that, that thought occurred in my head where that objection um, would have more force. Now, mm -hmm. here's a question I have for you, Christopher. I mean, suppose someone says like, well, you know what, look, we all have a right to life, right? And um, that right cannot be violated unless for some proportional reason, like let's say you're not innocent, right? So you're mm -hmm. guilty of taking another life. Well, then only in that context will I say that it is permissible to take your life or to pursue you know, the death penalty, right? Um, but like in the case of active euthanasia, you're dealing with an innocent human person who has an undefeated or who has a right to life. Okay, let's put it mm -hmm. like that. Um, is that a way to escape the um, argument you put forward? Uh, no. And here's why. I mean, obviously, just to be clear, I'm only talking about cases of voluntary active euthanasia. I, I, I don't think that this kind of reasoning would justify involuntary active euthanasia. Um, for just the reason you give, I mean, it, it would be a violation of the person's right to life. But once we get past that, right, I mean, I'm assuming the person consents, right, to this. And um, in that case, you could say, yeah, you, you could say they have a right to life, but obviously they're waiving that right. And if you say, oh, well, it's not, it's not the kind of right you can waive, well, then I would just recast the objection in the following terms. Why is the right to bodily integrity something uh, which is also a right that we have, the kind of right that we can waive, but but not the right to life, right? Given a survivalist metaphysics of the human person, right? Uh, that's another, that would be a way to, to reframe the problem um, for the survivalist, as I see it, right? Is to say, okay, if you're a survivalist, why is the right to bodily integrity, the kind of right that we can and sometimes may waive allowing people to chop our limbs off, 
but the right to life is not the kind of right that we can waive uh, such that if we'd like someone to put us out of our misery, we may not. Um, uh, one objection I've heard uh, to this from a member of my dissertation committee um, is to say, well, look, I mean, it's just because death, right? Death is different. Death, death is uh, just unlike losing parts of your body. But I think that's ultimately question begging because what I'm pushing, um, what I'm what I'm accusing the survivalist of with this argument basically is of not having the theoretical resources necessary to distinguish between death um, and to make a principal distinction between death and the loss of a limb or, or some other body part, right? What I'm saying is that for the survivalist, the difference between death and the loss of a smaller body part than the whole body is a difference in degree only and not in kind. And that only the corruptionist can credibly claim that there is a difference in kind between the loss of a body part and the loss of the whole body. All right. Well, Christopher, those are all the questions that I have for you. So I just want to thank you once again for coming out and talking about a very exciting and interesting topic. You know, like uh, I, I enjoy, even though I enjoy like doing research on the early papacy and the New Testament and the scriptures, I, I like going back to my philosophy roots and hearing something new. And so I appreciate you taking your time out for this, Christopher. I appreciate you having me on. I'm always excited to talk about this. And I, needless to say, with a dissertation left length project, I left a lot unsaid. So anybody who wants to um you know hear more about it is free uh, is free to you know reach out and contact me and give me their best objections or or or, or what have you um uh because i continue to be fascinated by this topic and it it holds at this point um not just academic but spiritual significance for me and uh so i, I love to uh take every opportunity i can to think and talk about it all right. Well, Christopher, thank you so much. And I'll talk to you sometime later in the future. Sure. Thank you, Swan.